Season 2 is the season that raises persistent questions from the show. It's a foundational season in that it establishes key mythological building blocks, but it also features a complicated series of events surrounding the Hatch, the computer, and Henry Gale's capture and subsequent escape. These events kick up all kinds of questions involving plot logistics, so this video will focus on and discuss the story mechanics around all of this in greater depth. I've already covered the Henry Gale story in a previous video, so feel free to check that out as well, as it makes for a good companion piece to this video. Before we get into the meat of this frequently asked question about the lockdown, we first need to establish what exactly the others knew about the Swan Station, and why they didn't have control over it. The question of how much the others knew about the Swan is an interesting one. There are those that believe the others were actually in the dark about its real purpose. This is mostly based off the lie that Ben tells to Locke in Season 2. I crawled through your vents, and I stood at your computer as the alarm beeped. And you know what happened? The timer went all the way down to zero. And then some funny red pictures flipped up in its place. They looked like hieroglyphics, but I'm no expert. And then things got real interesting. There was a loud clunking and a hum, like a magnet, a big magnet. It was really very frightening. And do you know what happened next? Nothing happened, John. Nothing happened at all. Your timer just slipped back to 108. I never entered the numbers. I never pressed the button. However, Ben was trying to undermine Locke's faith in the island. This was another manipulation. Ben never truly believed that the button would stop getting pushed because of the two-man team that the Oceanic 815 survivors had established. It was a risk to tell John this, but one that he felt was worth taking in order to plant the seed of doubt in the resident man of faith. And, as we see, he takes great delight in Locke's frustration at being uncertain. Ben is the ultimate gaslighter. Just look at how much he is enjoying making Locke doubt himself. We have to keep in mind that Ben is a very arrogant man who risks lives simply in order to flex his own hubris. He does this with his own daughter's life later on when facing down Kimi at the barracks. Except this time, his bluff gets called, and he loses. You just killed everybody on that boat. So? His cavalier attitude towards creating dangerous situations for human life, for the simple sake of mind games, manipulations, and personal victories, are well documented. You're lying. No, I'm done lying. Liar. I don't think it's possible that the others didn't know about the Swan, especially considering that Ben himself was an official Dharma Initiative member. The incident would have been widely spoken of within the community. The energy beneath the island was understood to be of great power, and the others knew of all the Dharma stations and their respective purposes. They might not have known about the specifics of how everything worked down in the hatch, but there is no way Ben wouldn't have known, or couldn't have known, about the button's importance. Otherwise, he really wouldn't have bothered to push it. Except, we know that he did push it. Furthermore, the others had an incredibly detailed and involved knowledge about the other Dharma stations, and frequently used them. Tom Friendly makes it clear that the others are aware of the hatch in the Season 2 episode, The Hunting Party. You go over a man's house for the first time, do you take off your shoes? Do you put your feet up on his coffee table? Do you walk in the kitchen and eat food that doesn't belong to you? Open the door to rooms you got no business opening? Season 3 episode Expose further confirms this fact when we see Ben and Juliet monitoring live camera feeds coming from the Swan when they visit the Pearl Station. 
The fact that Ben knew to use the pearl to observe life in the hatch is proof enough that the others had been watching events unfold in there on and off for some time. How frequently they kept an eye on Desmond and Kelvin is unknowable. They might not have even known about Kelvin's death and Desmond being alone down there for some time since they had their hands full with the crash of Oceanic 815 and the arrival of our Losties. A final confirmation is given in Season 5 episode, Because You Left. Even Juliet knew what was going on in the Swan, as she tells Miles the following piece of information. A Dharma station. For what? There was a man named Desmond living down in it. He was pushing a button every 108 minutes to save the world. Really? Yeah, really. So the likelihood of Ben and his people not knowing about the button and its importance, especially after the incident of 1977, is highly improbable. They know about the energy beneath the island, they know about what happens if it becomes destabilised, and they know about the dam that Dharma built to plug a leak that Dharma themselves had caused. The real question we should ask is this, why did the others never take back control of the Swan after the Purge? We know that the others left the Hatchmen alone to do their work down there, and one of the only members of the Dharma Initiative to survive the Purge on the island who didn't defect was Stuart Brzezinski. This channel previously hypothesised that Brzezinski was spared during the Purge for one reason, and one reason only, because he was the last man left on the island with the technical understanding of how the Swan Station actually worked. From the electromagnetic fluctuations, to the computer equipment that monitored everything, and from the Swan's reactor core, to the failsafe system designed to destroy it. Basically, he was far too integral and valuable to kill. So, a new truce was brokered between him and the others. Charles Widmore, the leader at the time, would allow him to live if he kept pushing the button to pay an ongoing penance for creating this catastrophic problem in the first place. As long as Radzinski continued to save the world, he would remain exempt from the Purge, and in return for his work, he would receive quarterly supply drops to replenish his food, and he would be given a hatch partner to enable the work to be carried out without any further incident. If you'll pardon the pun. But after Radzinski committed suicide, the situation changed. Logically, the others should have taken full control of the Swan like they had done with all the other stations, but as we find out with Locke and Boone in Season 1, it was almost impossible to penetrate the station in order to get inside unless someone lets you in. It's firmly established that there is no easy way to break into the hatch and gain access. It's the most secure bunker on the island, and with Rosinski now dead, the others were left with the paranoid, trigger-happy Kelvin Inman, who lacked the full history of what went down in the previous years. If Ben wanted to take the Swan by force, it could result in a firefight with Kelvin, and a stray bullet could easily damage the equipment or cause another incident. Just a brief tussle between Desmond and Jack resulted in killing the computer, and if it were not for Saeed, the world might have ended over a simple misunderstanding. The safest option for Ben and his people was to keep a close watch over the Button Men, and to allow the continued resupply drops to come to the island to keep them well nourished. There is also another possibility, and a very simple reason as to why the others never tried to take back control of the Swan, and that might be that Jacob simply ordered them to stay away from the hatch, so that Destiny could play out as planned. The only reason that Oceanic 815 crashes, with all of his candidates aboard, is because of the Hatch and Desmond, and that's also a perfectly valid explanation. So now that we've established all this, let's try to untangle the series of events that led to the lockdown in the first place. The others had kidnapped Walt, which is implied to have been on Jacob's orders, as we see in the Mobisode, Room 23. This is your responsibility. You are the one who wanted him here. Jacob wanted him here. He's important. He's special. He's dangerous. He's just a kid, Juliet. He's a child. At this point, the others had been woefully underprepared for containing Walt due to his frightening powers, but his specialness was also of great interest to them. In order to learn more about this boy, they needed some more context of his background and how he grew up. 
It was easy for them to get files on the adult crash survivors, as most of them would have extensive records and histories available, but for a ten-year-old boy, there would have been almost nothing they could dig up that could tell them what they needed to know. To learn more, they needed his father, Michael Dawson. But Michael was back at the Oceanic Beach Camp and impossible to extract without risking potential loss of life. The tail end survivors had already demonstrated that sneaking up on a large group of scared people could result in unnecessary bloodshed. So, if they could not come to Michael, then Michael would have to come to them. Some fans view Michael's communications with Walt via the Hatch computer as really being Walt, but this hardly makes much sense when we try to logic it out. Think of it like this. Walt must have somehow escaped his cell and gained access to a computer at the Hydra, where he was being kept, and out of all the computers connected to the island intranet, he just so happens to connect to the one in the hatch. And it is at this precise moment that Michael just happens to be lurking around the Swan computer, and Walt appears to be just casually typing responses in the meantime, without much urgency, until he realises who he is talking to. Not only that, but Walt later escapes his cell once again, and gains access to the Hydra computer, again, so he can give his dad very precise instructions on where to go and how to get there. And it just so happens that Michael runs into the others whilst following those very same instructions. Now, I know Lost is all about the crazy coincidences, but this doesn't seem even remotely plausible to me. What does make sense is that it was the others on the other end of the computer, trying to draw Michael out into the open, using the Pearl Station camera feeds of the hatch to observe the computer and waiting until Michael was within range to send him a message. It's also possible the message was sent from Mikhail at the Flame. We know these stations share an intranet between them and can be used for communications between stations, and the flame is literally the communications station. The others wanted to learn more about Walt, but to do that they had to get Michael away from the beach camp. They also probably thought that having Michael present might actually help them control the boy better. At the same time, Ben is also studying Jack's file, and watching him in the hatch, learning what the Doctor is emotionally attached to, and he is almost sure that using Kate could control Jack, and using Sawyer could control Kate. It's the same logic as to why Ben wants Michael, it's using people as emotional bargaining chips to make sure their captives do as they are told. We also know that after they had Michael for their research, the others were going to use him to lure out Jack once Ben was ready for the surgery. Two birds, one stone. Ben confirms this was the original plan in his scene with Juliet in the Pearl Station. So, what? We just grab all three of them, Ford and Austin too? No, they need to come to us. And how do we make that happen? Michael, of course. But the one thing the others could never have predicted happening was their leader, Ben, getting captured by the Frenchwoman, then locked up in the Hatch Armory. This flipped the script on everything they had been painstakingly planning for the past few weeks, and once news got back to the others about Ben's capture, they had to improvise a way in which to get him back. They couldn't storm the hatch by force, for reasons already mentioned, it's just too risky. So, they used Michael to bust out their leader, while also taking the window of opportunity to execute the original plan of baiting Jack, Kate and Sawyer out to the edge of the island. Now, the others are ironically given an opportunity to snatch all three of these key names when Michael first runs off into the jungle. In Season 2 episode, The Hunting Party, they have Jack, Kate and Sawyer all in one place, surrounded and outgunned. So, why don't they take them there and then? Let's think about the logistics of Ben's plan. At this point, he is still observing and learning about Jack trying to ascertain how best to manipulate the Doctor into performing the surgery, but it isn't until this very moment when it becomes clear what Jack truly cares about. He gives up his guns to save Kate, and walks away from Michael. Meanwhile, Kate's emotional connection to Sawyer would have already been demonstrated in the hatch and captured on the cameras, so it's actually after this confrontation that the others finally realise how to put the squeeze on Jack Shepard. 
Also, perhaps another reason they are not taken during the events of the hunting party is because John Locke is with them, and as we learn later, and have explored in other videos, Ben doesn't want the fabled John Locke anywhere near his people. Now, let's talk about the lockdown, which we see take place in the Season 2 episode of the same name. The Swan Station goes into some kind of automated security procedure that sees the blast doors close and seemingly lock in the current occupants of the hatch. But why does this happen when it does? And what exactly is the purpose of such a lockdown? Well, this lockdown procedure was no doubt designed and implemented by the deeply paranoid Stuart Rosinski. It is intended as an emergency system that could be triggered whenever the Swan came under threat. Its design appears to be a way of locking out intruders. After the incident of 1977, relations between the Others and the Dharma Initiative no doubt soured beyond repair. The Dharma compound believed that not only had a hostile shot one of their own kids, but other hostiles had infiltrated the barracks and started a gunfight before invading the Swan site and killing even more Dharma workers. Meanwhile, the others had found out about the Swan site and that Dharma had been breaking the terms of the truce for some time by digging in off-limit sectors of the island, and now Dharma had nearly destroyed all of them in this experiment gone wrong. The next decade of life on the island throughout the 1980s would have become more and more intense with diplomatic relations at breaking point, especially after Eloise Hawking leaves the island to give birth to Daniel Faraday, leaving the very frosty Charles Widmore in charge. And we know what his ultimate solution to the problem of Dharma turned out to be. During this time, construction was finished on the Swan, and the hatch was successfully built, However, Rosinski would have trusted very few people at this point. After all, James Lafleur and his recruits were embedded within Dharma for three years and might easily have been working with the hostiles all that time. We're talking about the head of Dharma security having been a turncoat, at least in their eyes. Rosinski also believes that the hostiles already tried once to invade the Swan site, so in a paranoid state of anxiety, Rosinski would have wanted to protect his station at all costs. To his mind, there was still a risk of an incursion by the hostiles. It appears that almost all Dharma stations had their own security measures that were baked into their construction. The Hydra was isolated from the mainland on a separate island that Dharma controlled. The staff was hidden in the jungle under camouflage sheeting. The orchid was also hidden. Its upper level was disguised as a botanical research garden in order to hide the real station's purpose underneath. The tempest was no doubt guarded by armed personnel. The flame was rigged with explosives in case the station was taken over by hostiles in order to stop them from using Dharma's own security and intelligence against them. The Looking Glass Station was offshore and underwater, considered inaccessible without the right equipment. Unless you're a good swimmer willing to take the plunge, of course. And the Swan was already being built with a security measure in place, an emergency escape hatch that was included so the station could be evacuated. Interestingly enough, if you look closely in the scene where Ethan takes Claire for a walk in the staff station, you can see a panel on the wall of the corridor clearly marked as Escape Hatch, which is a very subtle way of showing us, the audience, that each station comes with its own emergency exit, and that's exactly what the hatch tunnel is in the Swan. Although Rosinski appears to have welded it shut long ago so it could not be opened, the ladder has also been removed. It appears that Rosinski wanted to sure up the design of this newly built station even further, just in case. The blast doors are clearly there to protect the computer room in emergencies. We know that when the lockdown occurred in Season 2, while John Locke was alone in the hatch with Ben, it was triggered remotely by someone or something. The assumption is that the lockdown was related to the supply drop outside because of the timing. After all, the pallet of food clearly looks intended for the personnel in the hatch, and explains how they kept their shelves well stocked up by the time our losties arrived. 
Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse actually confirm this in a special feature on the Season 3 DVD. There's a lot of Dharma stuff on each one of those palettes, so, you know, I'm not sure how often you need more Dharma mac and cheese, but it, it, it would probably last six months. Yeah, for that's for a party of two. I mean, yeah. you know, that's like once Kelvin went away, um, right. Desmond was probably, you know, either getting double portions or who knows. The question then becomes, why would the Hatchmen need to be sealed in for this supply drop to take place? A speculation within the show actually posits a potential theory. Where did this come from? Lux had some kind of blastoise trapped him in the hatch. Maybe it was because of this, so no one would see who dropped him. But this speculation hardly makes sense under closer scrutiny. Why would the Hatchmen be at risk of seeing the pallet drop when they are stuck below ground? And why would it be necessary to hide it from them? In the epilogue, The New Man in Charge, we discover that the drops are sent by drones on an automated flight plan from a warehouse facility in Guam. It doesn't matter if the men in the hatch saw this drone. So the lockdown makes very little sense in the scenario that Charlie puts forward especially once you factor in the unnecessary dangers it creates. After all, if one or both of the Hatchmen were in the corridor when the blast doors closed, they would simply be sealed out of the computer room. Perhaps this is why the lockdown comes included with a 20 minute warning. The only reason that Locke doesn't hear it properly is because the speaker system is old and run down, barely audible. But this warning is clearly in place to allow the Hatchmen to get into position so that someone can man the computer for the duration of the lockdown. If the lockdowns are indeed rigged to be remotely triggered by pallet drops, then it would make sense, because the blast doors are there to ultimately protect key areas of the station. With a two-man team in place, one could stay with the computer while the other goes up top to bring back the supplies. The blast doors ensure that no hostiles could gain access to the swan during this process. Once the bulk of the supplies had been retrieved, within that time window, the blast doors retract and the hatch can continue to function as normal. It's even possible that that's what Kelvin was doing when he first came across Desmond. He was looking for the pallet drop. Anyway, that's the simplest explanation for what happened during the lockdown. However, there is also another possibility, that the lockdown was triggered by another station. Let's indulge that idea for just a moment and discuss a hypothetical possibility. If the others are still watching the swan, and we know that they have been, then the resupply drop presents an opportunity for Ben to exploit. We know he wasn't supposed to be captured. We know he isn't supposed to be locked up in the armory. The others obviously want him back, and they are also aware that the pallet drops arrive like clockwork this event window could provide a distraction to the Oceanic 815 beach camp. If everyone is busy dealing with a supply drop above ground, then maybe they won't be looking too closely at what was happening inside the swan below ground. They would see that Locke is the only present jailer down in the hatch at that point, as everyone else is distracted. This would have been an ideal chance for the others to facilitate a jailbreak for their leader to create the circumstances in which he could be let out of his cell. Locke's plan was to go beneath the blast doors and leave Ben alone, and this would have been more than enough time for Ben to wriggle through the vents and to a possible exit. The hiccup is that Locke gets trapped beneath the blast door, which leaves the computer unattended, and Ben, for all of his deceptions, still knows that the button must be pushed, therefore he must take Locke's place. We also see that Ben isn't ready to leave his situation behind, because he is learning more about Locke and, more importantly, Jack, and the other survivors that he encountered. During the lockdown, I was hurt. He could have escaped. <clears throat> but he came back to help me. Why would he do that? He didn't come back to help you, John. He came back because he thought his story was going to check out. And that's true. 
Ben decides to remain, believing that his Henry Gale story will be confirmed, and that he can embed himself deeper with the survivors. But, as we know, the story doesn't check out. He is exposed, and at that point, he probably wishes he had taken that window of escape. The theory that the others triggered the lockdown remotely to help their leader break out is potentially supported further by preceding events, because it is only a mere two days later that Michael returns to the camp with secret orders to break out the man known as Henry Gale. So, the timing is very interesting, because the others only instruct Michael to retrieve Ben after the lockdown, and not before. This is all speculation, of course. The most likely scenario is that the lockdown was automatically triggered by the drone passing over the island, which sent out a signal and caused the lockdown. This might have been the procedure for many, many years. However, the lockdown being triggered as a way to provide an escape plan for Ben is a more fun and intriguing way to view the events of the episode in retrospect. And there you have it. I hope this video clears up some of the lingering questions that surround the events of Season 2 in The Hatch. For more explanations on how and why The Hatch was built, watch my video on Jughead and whether or not it detonated. And to find out more about the history of what happened down in the Swan between Radzinski and Kelvin, and their possible dynamic together, and who exactly recruited Kelvin in the first place, please watch my video on The Purge. There is still so much more to come, please like, share and subscribe to keep this channel alive. And if you really like what you see in here, please consider donating to the Patreon to help me make more videos like this. Thank you for watching. Until the next time, stay lost.